Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Happy good morning. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Today, Byron, Danielle, and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a very blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Danielle, will you pray for God's blessing on this Let's, Bible study this morning? Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful for your love for us, for your providing every day, your blessings, uh, and your protections. Lord, we are so um, humbled to be here to discuss your word. Uh, Lord, cover our inadequacies and send your Holy Spirit to speak to us. May your words be heard, not ours. And Lord, please uh, bless us with your presence and your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 This week's Sabbath School lesson is titled, The Fires of Hell. And I hope that uh, Byron and Danielle and I will do justice by open scripture and sharing uh, scripture to you today. The key test text or memory text is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21. And it is a couple of very short sentences. Test all things, says the Lord. And then he says, hold fast to what is good. In this verse, the Apostle Paul is um, cautioning the Thessalonians not to despise the gift of prophecy. In reality, that's what he's saying. And caring uh, and careful, he, he asks them to discriminate and distinguish the false from the true prophet. But the, the verse is deeper than that. And so Paul is also telling you and I that we need to test through Scripture spiritual gifts. And that we are able to do this when we have discerned the difference between the true and the false, the good and the bad spiritual gifts. And then Paul encourage, uh, encourages you and I to hold on and to retain the good spiritual gifts in spite of all temptations to let it go. And this is a great counsel. Here is a brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson. In Scripture, in the Bible, the eternal um, the destinies of the righteous and the wicked are described in sharp contrast to each other. Scripture tells us that the righteous receive everlasting life. Let's read it. John chapter 5, verses 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, says the Lord, he who hears my word and believes in him, and that him is God the Father, who sent me as everlasting life and shall not come unto judgment, but has passed from death unto life. But the scriptures also tell us that the wicked will experience God's painful judgment of condemnation and will be totally annihilated, totally destroyed. Let's read what Malachi says in chapter 4, verses 1. For behold, the day is coming, says the prophet, burning like a hoven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. Ooh, this is a profound word. He goes on to say, And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that, <clears throat> that will leave them neither root nor branch. I can tell you that no stronger language could be used to indicate the complete destruction of the wicked, the ungodly. This verse tells us that the wicked will not linger on the everlasting suffering. So thorough is the destruction that the verse tells us neither root nor branch remains, but only ashes. You see, the big lie of eternal punishment and of the perpetual suffering of the wicked in hell is built on the satanic deception expressed in the Garden of Eden, as we read in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4. And let's, and let's read it. It says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. 
Unfortunately, this text, this statement, which contradicts the biblical teachings regarding the punishment of the wicked, has become the foundation of erroneous beliefs among many people and many Christian churches. The writer of this week's lesson introduces us to um, an Italian poet, Dante Alighieri, who lived in the 13th century and who wrote his famous work, The Divine Comedy, a poem about a fictional journey of the soul after death. In this poem, Dante describes the soul going either to hell, the inferno as he calls it, a Latin word for hell, within the earth, or to purgatory, where the human spirit can purge itself and become worthy of ascending to heaven, or to paradise, to the presence of God himself. Now, we know this is not biblical. However, even though this was only a poem, and more, fiction, Dante's words ended up having a great deal of influence on Christian theology, especially the Roman Catholic theology. The basic notion of an immortal soul, going either to hell or to purgatory or to paradise, is foundational to the Catholic Church and its beliefs. Many conservative Protestants uh, and pro Protestant denominations also believe in the immortal soul that after death ascends either to paradise or descends to hell. Indeed, if the human soul never dies, then it has to go somewhere after the body dies. It is just unfortunate that a false understanding of human nature has led to terrible theo theological errors. Based on the lie that disobedience will not bring death, as we read in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4, deceptions and false hopes, false beliefs, have been established and embraced. A significant number of Christians believe today that when one dies, it is the body that is dead, not the spirit. Thus, if one has an immortal soul or spirit that cannot die, a sinner will be eternally punished by God in torturous hellfire. This horrendously negative view pictures your God and my God as a monster and a tyrant. This belief that when one dies, it is only the body that is dead, not the spirit, misleads people by giving them the false hope of going through a process of purification and improvement after their death that may culminate with being rescued or granted eternal life in paradise. This lie removes accountability for personal action in this life. This is a serious problem. If the Bible teachings on this subject were followed and embraced correctly, we would not have doctrines such as canonization of the saints, purgatory, religious masses held for the dead, the invocation of saints, and the worship of Virgin Mary. Neither would we have other teachings, such as spiritism and transmigration of soul, which also have their origin in the false concept of life after death. This week's Sabbath school deals with some of these and biblical theories, addresses the popular views of an eternal hell and a cleansing purgatory, as well as the biblical view of what happens after death. Danielle, please explain Isaiah 66, verse 24. So Sunday's lesson is entitled, Immortal Worms. I must say, I said, why did I get that? <laughs> Of all things that I like to talk about, worms is not one of them. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> so there is a text in the Bible, uh, a few texts in the Bible that talk about worms, but one in particular that has been misused uh, by Christianity to 
kind of support views that are not necessarily biblical. So we've got to look at them as pleasant as they might be. So let's start and look at them right away. First of all, in Isaiah 66, chapter, chapter 66, verses 22 to 24. And this is Isaiah prophecy about things at the end times and second coming and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. So let's read. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. So it's a promise to the believers. It's a good promise. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. So basically, the, the celebrations of Sabbath are continuing. And even the, some of the celebrations of moon festivals that they had will be continuing. Uh, the Lord is saying so. And they shall go forth and look, and they shall, uh, but this is where it gets different. And they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm does not die, and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. So it's like all of a sudden we have a vision from going, we're, we're looking in heaven and the new Jerusalem and the celebrations and death. They're looking upon dead bodies that are being decomposed and fires. You know, the same verse, the interesting part is that Jesus, in one of he, when he was on this earth, he basically warned of the offenses uh, of sin. We're using the same verse. So let's look at that. What exactly did he say? So in Jesus' words in Mark chapter 9, verses 42 to 48, Jesus warns of offenses and he says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If it, it is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched, where, quote, so he's quoting exactly Isaiah, their worms, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And he continues, and if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame. And when he's talking about life, he's talking about life everlasting, rather than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So we can see that it's a picture of uh, punishment. It's a picture of judgment. That's really what it is. And he's quoting it exactly to the T. Now, the reason we're looking at it is because this is used uh, in, in uh, th there are kind of like three views of punishment that come uh, when it comes to eternal hellfire. Um, one is the traditionalist view, that hellfire that torments forever and ever without ceasing, where disembodied spirits are there and there being uh, immortal souls, that souls not used that the way the Bible describes it, souls, but sort of like spirit, bodiless forms uh, being punished. So they basically claim that when one dies, your body just separates from your spirit format and you go into some heaven or hell. So, but that's not necessarily biblical and we'll see why. And then it's the biblical view which is also called conditionalist and it's talking about what it says in Revelation that at the second judgment the, those that are judged unfit for heaven they will be thrown in the lake of fire. Uh, and we're going to look at that a little bit. And then there is yet another view uh, that it's called restor restorationist or universalist is actually a more common word mm -hmm. where hellfire ultimately purifies and saves everyone. And that's the idea that you go to purgatory and you get cleansed up and somehow you end up to heaven anyhow. Uh, but really, what does the Bible say? First, let's look at worms. I mean, worms are something that's necessary in, on this earth. It's like something that God created, and he's using them to decompose and cleanse this earth and reuse substances. Mm, but when we're looking at these worms, they are basically almost sounding like immortal worms, but that's not really what the Bible is saying. 
Another place where we read about worms is Isaiah 14:11, and we can see that it says, "Your pomp is brought down to Sheol." It's talking to someone that is arrogant, and it says that their pomp is being brought down to the grave. And the sound of your stringed instruments, the maggot, is spread under you, and worms cover you. So it's like decomposing. It's like the end of you. But the question is, from this view, what is this text trying to say? Does this mean that people will be in heaven, going in and checking out? Will there be something so defiling in heaven? Let's see what it says in Revelation chapter 21, verses 25 to 27, about which describes heaven. It says, "Its gates shall not be shut at all." By day, there shall be no night there. So we can see it's an open gate,、mm-hmm. and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. So it's a glorified place with many peoples and nations. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So there is no destruction, defilement, or anything that's going to be there. Um, so I think we need to cover a little bit of where this decomposing can come up. The, when we're looking at the second coming, we have already studied last week in First Thessalonians four, chapter chapter four, from verses thirteen to eighteen, the process of what happens at the second coming. So we know that at the second coming, Jesus descends, and with a shout of the archangel, he basically. Lifts up the people that are alive, the saints, so to speak, the believers, and then with the trumpet call of God, raises up the dead, and then both of them together are lifted up and meet the Lord in the air. But what is happening to the earth in that meantime? Let's read Second Peter chapter three, verse ten. At the day of the Lord, which is the second coming, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which Heavens will pass away with a great noise. So it will come suddenly, but it will be quite an upheaval, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So there will be a lot of destruction, obviously. And we have other texts that we have studied before, where people that are left behind, the ones that are not believers, they will die at that time.、Uh, so we can see where they will be decomposed. We can kind of understand the statement of the. Worms, but then what happens afterwards? So we have to read fairly quickly in Revelation chapter twenty. The process. That's the only the best way I can do it fairly fast. So the believers are lifted up with Jesus in the air, and then comes the thousand years. Revelation chapter twenty, verse one. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. So we know that for a thousand years the devil doesn't have anyone to deceive. He's basically in this pose, so to speak, and people are dead on the earth, decomposing. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw. The saints and I saw the thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. So basically, in the next few verses, we see the believers in heaven with the Lord,、uh, reviewing the books. So they're basically doing a review of what the Lord had decided already in judgment, so that they could see why their loved ones are not there and why they're there. And then after the thousand years are over, in verse seven. Now that the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations, which are the four corners of the earth, and so on and so forth. And he he tries to the the dead that are not believers are now resurrected at the second resurrection, which is the resurrection of damnation. And at this point in time, the judgment is made a decision, and they are thrown in the lake of fire. So that is really where we can connect these. These、uh, words, and I'm not going to cover the never-ending fire because Byron's going to cover that. I am. So I'm passing it on to Byron. Monday, the fires of hell. We see in the lesson for today、uh, the children's booklet titled "The Sight of Hell," and basically it illustrates a large solid iron ball. 
that's larger than the earth. Mm -hmm. A little piece is taken off every hundred million years. That is one way to imagine eternity now, isn't it? Billions and billions of years that this hellish torture will continue. Basically, wow. Nothing like traumatizing and conditioning those small children when they're young, huh? Just to keep them in line. But nowhere in the Bible is that spoken of. Not a single verse anywhere. We have Revelation 14.11, which says something that could be interpreted like that. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. And we can also look at Revelation 20.10 because it says forever and ever, right? But we can look at Revelation 20.10 and say, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. But does it really mean forever and ever? Because if we look at verse 9, just before that it says, And they came up on the broad plain of the earth, and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. There's no forever or forever with ever and ever with devouring, that is. So, does the Bible contradict itself? No, we're, we're going to cover that later. So if it wasn't in the Bible, how did this idea of eternal punishment get started? Where did it begin? Now we have the idea that Victor brought up about the soul being immortal, and that's the lie from Satan. But um, why don't we take a look at Greek mythology? A lot of the Greek and Roman ideals have worked their way into Christianity now, haven't they? We're going to look at four punishments that, and if you went to public high school, as I did, you had to study Greek mythology. So this should be at least fairly remembrant or rememberable. Um, but the first one of those punishments in the underworld, or Hades as it's called, is um, Cepheus. Now he had a roll of boulder up a mountain. And I believe that they said that he would be free if he ever got it to the top. And he almost gets it up there and then something would slip and it would roll all the way back down. And he was doing that for basically all eternity. We have Exion. He's on a spinning wheel that happens to be on fire. Supposedly, he's still spinning and burning today. There's Tantalus. He was in Hades for all eternity with an insatiable hunger and thirst. There was a pool and fruit trees dangling over the pool. When he reached for the fruit, it would just, just get out of reach by the slightest little amount. And when he went to drink, the pool would drain. So it was just out of reach again. Once again, for all eternity. And then there's Dionysus' daughters. They had 50 daughters, and they were marrying 50 sons, their cousins. 49 of them actually killed their husbands on their wedding night. Their father told them to do it. And they were condemned to the underworld. They were told to cleanse their sin by washing in basins that they would fill with water from the river Styx. Unfortunately, the basins had so many holes in the bottom, they could never actually be filled. Oh, tough luck for them, huh? So we see all of these examples of people being tortured for all eternity. Sound familiar? I wonder, our, when we took a look at Dante on Sabbath, I wonder if he had some inspiration from this. But we know who really is the, the source behind all of this, don't we? The truth is, it's the devil with all of his deceptive powers. And let me tell you something. I knew this guy in college, Vince. I'll leave his last name out. Vince had a problem with lying. And I asked him bluntly one day. I looked at him and said, Vince, you've been lying for years. How do you get away with it? And he told me, he goes, if you hear it enough, you will begin to believe it's true. And isn't that what we see in the world today? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the devil plays it out very, very well. So now that we've heard enough lies, let's hear some truth. The quotes from Malachi 4.1 and Jude 7. Let's read them. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave on them neither root nor branch. 
In other words, completely consumed. Jude 7, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Now, we see that phrase eternal fire. And when I see it, we wonder, what does that mean? You think eternal, right? But words don't always mean necessarily what we think they do, especially when they get translated. We see in the lesson the word eternal, Hebrew, olam, and Greek, ion, or ionis, and what it means depends on how it's used. For instance, in the lesson, it covers Deuteronomy 33, 27. We'll read the first half. The eternal God in a dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Now, that is truly eternal as we think of it, forever and ever, till infinity, right? So, now we see in that, let's look at olam as it's used in a lifetime. And in the King James, I like it, it does actually say forever, but Exodus 21, 6. Then his master shall bring him to God. Then he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl. This is talking about a slave. And he shall serve him permanently. So once his time is up, he could choose to stay a slave for the rest of his life there. And that word permanently, which in the King James Version is forever, is olam again. Now we read examples of the eternal fire in Malachi 4.1 and Jude 7 that we just read. And after thinking about it, I think the best earthly example I can come up with is napalm. Believe it or not. And yes, I made this once in college, so I, I know. I was not as wise back then. But napalm clings to something, and when it's ignited, it simply burns until it's consumed. Napalm burns whatever it's stuck to, as well as the napalm itself. It doesn't go out. Water, wind, stomping it out, none of that works. If you try and stomp it out, your shoe just catches on fire. It burns until there is nothing left to burn, and then it goes out. That actually sounds like eternal fire. So we see this in the same way that eternal fire burns, and it can't be put out until there's nothing left to burn. And who is that eternal fire sticking to? the wicked. And just in case you think that this is normal for God, I want to read Isaiah 28 verses 21 through 22. For the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perizim. He will be stirred up as in the valley of Gibeon to do his task, his unusual task. And actually that would literally in the translation that literally is a task that is strange. In other words, something odd for God to do. And to work his work, his extraordinary work. And now to, care, or to not carry on as scoffers, or your fetters will be made stronger. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts on decisive destruction on all the earth. That would be the second death. Where the wicked will burn as a result of their sin. But then... It's done, and they cease to exist. There's no eternal torture. The only eternal on the second death is that the wicked come to nothing forever. And that is truly forever and ever. And sin will no longer exist forever and ever as well. Won't that be a glorious day? As Danielle said, the doors aren't even shut because there's no one to worry about. Amen. Thanks so much, Byron. Thank you, Danielle. Tuesday's uh, lesson is titled Saints in Purgatory. I'm not sure that I would go with it 100%. Uh, I think the purgatory has, was brought into as a cleansing process. But <clears throat> closely related to the, to the notion of an always burning hell, which Byron has just, has just handled, is the Roman Catholic doc doctrine of purgatory which according to the 25th session of the Council of Trent, which really took place during the years 1545 to 1563 AD, should, and I'm going to quote, be believed and maintained 
by the faithful of Christ and be everywhere taught and preached. Therefore, in fulfillment of this mandate, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which was originally published in 1566 AD, confirmed the alleged existence of, and I'm going to quote, the fire of purgatory, in which the souls of just men and cleansed by a temporary punishment in order to be admitted in their eternal country. I'm quite amazed with this doctrine. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it's uh, um, published in New York by Doubleday in 1999, uh, page 291, also states that their suffering can be alleviated by the prayers of the loved ones, as well as by other acts on, on behalf of the dead. Here's what it says. The church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. Amazing. Just amazing. Instead of believing that the dead are asleep, awaiting Christ's return, this view says that the dead are in purgatory, suffering there until someone manages to get them out. So the question is, what does the Bible say? Are these teachings biblical? Is purgatory an element of the salvation of mankind? The dogma, and that really is the doctrine of purgatory, combines the pagan notion of a burning hell with the pagan practice of praying for the dead. This dogma, this teaching, is not biblical, and it is unacceptable for those who believe in the biblical teachings. So here are the teachings of Scripture, and I'm going to read with you about five of these. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 10. Here's what the Bible tells us. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you and I are going if the Lord doesn't come before. Here, Scripture tells us that the dead remain resting unconsciously in their grave. Okay, let's continue. Ezekiel chapter 18 verses 20 to 22. Powerful stuff. It says, verse 20, the soul who sins shall die. So if I sin and you sin, we shall die. Then he goes on to say, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. Still in verse 20 it says, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. This is tremendous, tremendous scripture. Let's continue. Verses 21 and 22. This is what it says in Ezekiel. But if a wicked man turns from all sins, which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He should not die. And we're talking about the second death. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done, and he shall live. This passage of Scripture is telling you and I that all souls belong to God by right of creation. And the soul is a full human being, spirit and a physical being. We are his creatures, and God will deal with us without partiality and prejudice. But the, this, this scripture also tells us that every human being is responsible for his or her own life and accountable to God and judged by him according to one's own work. Thus the Lord tells us here that the righteousness of the fallen human being cannot be transferred to another fallen human being. Let's go on. First Timothy 
chapter 2, verses 5. This piece of scripture tells us, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. Paul is telling you and I here that our only mediator is Jesus Christ. I cannot mediate for my wife when she's dead. That's really what it says. And then Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 says, it is appointed for men to die once, and after this, the judgment. Paul makes it clear in this portion of Scripture that death is followed by the final judgment without any second chance to repent from the pity falls of this life. Another serious implication is how this anti-biblical theory of purgatory distorts God's own character. Ellen G. White, in Manuscript 51, written in 1890, says, and I'm going to quote, Satan's work since his fall is to misrepresent our Heavenly Father. She goes on to say, he suggested the dogma of the immortality of the soul. The idea of an eternally burning hell was the production of Satan. Purgatory is Satan's invention. These teachings falsify the character of God, that he shall be regarded as severe, revengeful, arbitrary, and not exercising forgiveness. It is noteworthy to mention that Martin Luther fought against these religious beliefs and practices. In a lecture he gave in 1545 A.D., just a few months before his death, he stated, Of purgatory, says Martin Luther, there is no mention in Holy Scripture. It is a lie of the devil in order that the papists may have some market days and snares for catching money. And I'm not going to give any commentary to that. You make up your own mind to it. So what we believe is very important. It forms and defines your journey and my journey here on earth and in heaven with our Savior. The Bible and the Bible alone, the Word of God, needs to be our guide and the foundation for all our doctrinal beliefs. Daniel, God's paradise be made up of disembodied souls. Can you unpack that for us? This is a continuation of what you've already covered. So a paradise of disembodied souls. And, and this is again referring to the idea that, uh, when, that a lot of Christians misguidedly have been led to believe um, faithful Christians have been led to believe that when they die or when their loved one dies, that something happens and the body uh, may end up in the grave, but some form of spiritual glorified body still moves on to heaven and uh, leaves ahead of time either to purgatory for some uh, temporary punishment and then eventually to heaven or directly to heaven depending on their works. Now, as we've already, you've already covered, there isn't a word of that in the Bible, so we don't have any texts to even support that view on this lesson at all, not even some that can be misconstrued. So uh, we need to just go directly to scriptures and look at what scriptures say, and we've already studied a lot of scriptures looking at death and what happens. But there, we haven't covered everything because the Bible is quite extensive on this. So the first text that I'd like to look with you at is in Acts chapter 2, verses 29. And this is Peter, the Apostle Peter, and he is talking, and he is talking to the believers, the early Christian church. And he says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. I mean, who is he talking to? He's talking to converted believers that come from all sorts of Greek mythologies and all those kind of mixed faith. So he's having to be very direct and exact to them. And he is talking about uh, uh, 
David, and he continues in verse 34 to 35, and he says, "For David did not ascend into heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, because he's talking about the vision and prophetic vision that David had, and when he wrote in in, in the Psalms, and he says, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool." So he very clearly, for them not to misunderstand, he is underlining the fact that David had not ascended to heaven and that he had heard that in a vision and that he is buried. And we know, they know where he is uh, buried, where his tomb is. I mean, we don't know to this day, but they did where David's tomb was. And we continue uh, with the Apostle Paul. And we've looked at this text, I think, last week a few times, but we'll look at it again. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 16 through 18, and it says, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. The idea is that if whatever is believed that people go on to either purgatory and heaven and then after purgatory to heaven, then why do we need a resurrection? I mean, why did Jesus get resurrected? Why didn't he just go directly also? Those are the questions that the apostle is trying to point out to them in these. It's like, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. So a resurrection will be happening. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Like, in other words, if we don't have a resurrection, and if Jesus wasn't resurrected, then those that have died in Christ will have perished forever. That's basically what he's saying. So he's trying to underline to them with clarity that there will be a resurrection, that Christ was resurrected. So this idea of moving on to something directly in a spiritual form, it's not it. Plus, we know very clearly when we studied the ascension, when Jesus was resurrected, he was in bodily form resurrected. The, he ate he was touched by the disciples, right. and then in that form, he was lifted up at the ascension, as we read in the gospel. And at that moment, they were told, the, the disciples were told, in such, why are you gazing like that into heaven? In such form, the Lord will return. So at the second coming, he'll be coming in that bodily form. Everything is bodily form. It's not smoke, fume, whatever. Genesis 2.17 is what God told us is going to happen to those that eat out of the tree of knowledge of good. So as we know, Adam and Eve were told not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but if they would eat, for in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's what God said. What did the devil? He started the lie. Right after, the devil in Genesis 3, 4 says, Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. And that's really the beginning of these ideas and ideologies that we are looking at that are roaming through the Christian world. But what does the Bible say? Psalm 146, 4. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. That's what happens to someone when they die. In Ecclesiastes, I think you covered that, 9, 5 to 6. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. They can't even watch it. They're asleep. And then Ecclesiastes 9.10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. But you know the believer, the, the Christians many times when we look at the Bible text, they are pointing out quickly to Enoch and to Moses and to Elijah because they were on the Mount of Transfiguration. But we know why they were there, because the Bible tells us so. In Genesis chapter 5 or 24, we know that Enoch was translated to heaven. He did not die. It says, and Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. And then in, we know Elijah the same. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, talking about Elijah saying goodbye to Elisha and as it's happening, it says, And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what may I do for you before I am taken away from you. I mean, Elijah was already told. He knew he was going to be taken away. He knew he wasn't going to die. Elisha said, 
Please let a double portion of your spirit to be upon me. So he said, that's what Elijah replied. You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened. As they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So it's very clear we know that Elijah never died. And then we know Moses died, but he was resurrected because in Jude chapter 9, this is, chapter 9 is that short. It's like one verse about Moses. One chapter. I mean, one chapter is one verse. It's like very short. This is it. Yet Michael the archangel in contending with the devil. Who's Michael the archangel? Is Jesus as we've studied before. So he in contending with the devil when he disputed over the body of Moses, dare not to bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So obviously Jesus and was contending with the devil over the body and just rebuked the devil back and took the body of Moses, so resurrected him. So we, we know that there was also another group, one last group of people that were resurrected uh, besides Jesus in, at the crucifixion. So in Matthew chapter 27, verses 51 to 53. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were open. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. I like to close and also do my comments for closing, my final comments since we are here. The Bible is very clear and our only salvation, I mean, we're told that in the last days, even the elect could be deceived. And we are told that in the Bible, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, that all scripture that means the Old Testament, New Testament, every scripture needs to be reviewed on every subject. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God, that would be us, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then we are also told in Isaiah 28.10 that we are to study on this subject precept, for precept must be upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a title and there, a, here a little and there a little. So we are not to take one text from here and one text from here to come up with a conclusion. We are to study all texts that we are given in the entire scripture on every subject. Thanks so much, Danielle. Byron, explain to us the biblical view. The biblical view, what we actually believe, not what we've been told or exactly. fed or been, how should I put it, bamboozled into believing. Okay, let's start off by reading the verse for today's lesson. John, 1 John 5, verses 3 through 12. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, especially when we take his yoke and give him ours. Verse 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son. The one who believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe, God has made or made him a liar, or that, I'm sorry, the one that does not believe God has made him a liar, that's Jesus, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. The testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, 
and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. So, first of all, we see the water and spirit testify at Jesus' baptism. Don't we? At the beginning of his ministry. And we see the blood testifying at the cross. So we see, really, the culmination of the key to eternal life as the ministry of Christ and what he's done for us. We have to realize that, let's start off with man was created in the beginning. But before we do that, who has eternal life? Who, who was the only person? Three of them, actually. <laughs> the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nobody else has eternal life. And you can't kill God. You can kill an angel, but you can't kill God. So let's start at the beginning when man was created. Genesis 2-7. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul, or living being, some versions say, but literally it's soul. So the only soul mentioned in the Bible is a living soul. The only combination of a, uh, only the combination of a body and the breath of God, the breath of life, makes a living soul. So literally you want the equation body plus breath of life equals living soul. Okay, that's the only soul there is. Biblically speaking, so how could a soul exist without a body, let alone be immortal? It is that simple. We know that Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. We know that they ate from the tree of life to sustain them indefinitely. And then we know that through their sin, death entered the world. So let's take it to the next step. Now that we're looking at what we believe, when Adam had lived 130 years, this is Genesis 5.3, he became the father of a son in his own likeness according to his image and named him Seth. So whose image was Seth created in? Adam's. And whose image was Adam created in? God's. So literally, we have all had the pleasure of being molded from a defective mold. And literally, even Adam, though, without the tree of life, he would not have lived forever. So you look at Seth. Seth was made from a broken, decaying tendency to sin flesh of Adam. Doesn't sound so good, does it? By the way, that's not the greatest way to start off life. But let me ask you, is there anything eternal here outside of God? Not a bit. So let's read Genesis 3, verses 4 through 5. Then the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The devil has perpetuated the same lie since the beginning. You will not die is the first one, and the second is that you will be like God. In a sense, Adam and Eve almost could be looking at the eternal eternity that God actually has as well, because he's saying, not only will you not die, you'll be like God in many ways. So, previously in John 1, 5, the spirit, the water, and the blood testify of the only way to eternal life, and that is through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We look at John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So he is the only road that leads there. So let me ask you, Danielle talked about Enoch, Moses, and Elijah. So Enoch was translated to heaven. How was it that he was translated to heaven? How did he get eternal life? It was because of the promise of the sacrifice of Christ at the cross. Moses, when he is resurrected and translated, he's in heaven because of the promise of Jesus' sacrifice. And when Elijah was taken to heaven in a fiery chariot and translated, it was also on the promise of that sacrifice. So if Jesus did not take the path to be our sacrificial lamb, to be the solution of sin for sin and for death in this world, nobody 
was getting eternal life except for the Creator Himself. He imparts it to us. It is a gift. Something the devil would like you to believe differently, but the only way we are ever going to live for all eternity is through Jesus Christ. Matthew 27, 52 and 53, and Daniel read part of this. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his, as Jesus' resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. They know what it's like to be, have eternal life as well. When Christ returned to heaven, they were taken with him. And we read that through the spirit of prophecy. So all those who have fallen asleep in Christ Jesus can look forward to seeing what next? To seeing Jesus in the clouds coming, then they themselves will rise in incorruptible eternal bodies. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. And that is the only eternity we will ever see. The angels in heaven who are loyal to God, they will spend eternity. Lucifer, Satan, and all of his minions, they will know what it feels like to be ended forever. So... If someone asks you, why don't you think the soul is immortal? You have plenty of answers. The lesson for today, the fires of hell and the eternal implication. I want to read Genesis 21, verses 1 and 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And verse 4, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no longer any, any, or be no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, for the first things have passed away. Can you? And we know this happens after the second death. We know it happens, and we might very well, if you're in heaven, know somebody who's out there. But the point is this: Can you see? God wiping away any, every tear and no longer having any death or suffering if you could go to a hell and watch people burn? That's not the God I know. Hopefully that's not the God you know either. Thank you so much, Byron and Danielle. Um, what an incredible promise that God provides us uh, in, in the scripture that you have read. I hope that this week's study of our Sabbath school lesson has been meaningful to you. Uh, those who believe in the theory of the natural immortality of the soul have defined paradise and hell as specific places already habited by countless disembodied souls that are still alive. Really sad. This immortalist view is contrary to the biblical teachings and provides at least six serious implications and I want to review these with you this morning that's really something I want to leave behind and because this is being recorded you will have an opportunity to go back to it if you need to I'm going to go through these six serious implications the first serious implication is the view of an always burning hell and a paradise with disembodied souls this belief is based on the Greek philosophical theory, Byron spoke about that, of the natural immortality of the soul, and not on the biblical teaching of the conditional immortality of the human being. As we have read this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 1 John chapter 5, the Bible asserts the immortality as a gift of God to be granted at the second coming of Christ to those who are in Christ. And all the wicked with ult will ultimately be destroyed, leaving them neither root nor branch, as we read in Malachi chapter 4, verses 1. This means that there will be 
no forever burning hell as evident from Sodom and Gomorrah ancient cities that were totally consumed by an eternal fire that is no longer burning as we read in Isaiah as we as we read in Isaiah chapter 34 10 and Jude verse 7 the second implication of the immortalist theory is that it anticipates the final reward of the righteous and the final punishment of the wicked as starting immediately after death by contrast as we read in John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29 Jesus referred to the dead as still being verse 28 in the grave not yet in paradise or in hell and that the time is coming when they verse 28 will hear his voice um, and then verse 29 says and I'm talking obviously about John 5 29 and come forth this is God calling the dead come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation the third implication of the immortalist theory is that it requires every soul to have been rewarded or punished before the final judgment some have tried to solve this problem by suggesting the existence of an individual judgment immediately after death if this is the case why should there be a final judgment of the dead by contrast the Bible affirms in Revelation chapter 20 verses 12 that the wicked will be punished only after they are judged. And this is what the verse says. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. But the things which were written in the heavenly books, or by the things that were written in the heavenly books, this will happen a thousand years after Jesus' second coming. The fourth implication of the immortalist theory is that it makes the final resurrection of the dead senseless. If the souls of the saints are already in paradise and the souls of the wicked are already in hell, why should they return from their final destination only to go back to where they belong once judgment takes place? The scriptures teach the final resurrection of human beings and not the natural immortality of human souls. And Byron explained that pretty well in his Thursday presentation. The Bible also teaches that only after the righteous are raised from the dead will they be granted the gift of immortality, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The fifth implication with the immortalist theory is that it makes all human souls naturally immortal, including the souls of impenitent sinners if this theory were correct then we would need to admit that sin had a beginning but will never have an end the consequ and consequently good and evil will have to coexist in the universe forever this is not the teachings of scripture the final implication with the immortalitist theory is of an always burning hell in which the souls of all the wicked will be punished throughout eternity. This is not biblical and is totally disproportional to the short lifespan of human beings here on earth. If, as we read in Ezekiel chapter 1832, our loving God has no pleasure in the dead of one who dies, why would he allow a wicked teenager who died at, at a young age to be endlessly punished in hell? This 
non-biblical immortalist theory portrays the image of a sadist God which is completely incompatible with our God's loving and just character as revealed throughout scripture. Ellen G. White in the Great Controversy, pages 674, tells us that every trace of the curse is swept away. Sin will be no more, the wicked will be no more, the devil will be no more, and the demons will be no more. She goes on to say, no eternally burning hell will keep before the ransom the fearful consequences of sin. Once this world is purified with fire, and the wicked, the devil, and the demons are burned, that fire will be totally consumed, for punishment is rendered. The Bible assures us that God will not maintain a penal colony anywhere on earth. The entire universe will finally be restored to its original harmony and perfection. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I am just delighted that, Lord, you have provided your word and a Bible containing your word to teach us the truth. Lord, I pray that we go to the word to know the truth and that, Lord, through the Holy Spirit, that you allow us to embrace the truth and to live by it every day. So we don't live with false doctrine, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.